Uh, anyway, we should have a moon base alpha, which is the next step after the Apollo program would be to have a base on the moon. The race back to the moon just turned into a sprint, and NASA is being left in the dust. SpaceX has revealed its plan for a permanent moon base, and it's shockingly fast. Land a starship, and the base is built. This single step could put humans on the moon permanently, within years, not decades. This aggressive timeline is big trouble for NASA, whose own plans now seem painfully slow. For America's rivals, China and Russia, who have their own careful, long-term ambitions, this news is a strategic shock they simply can't believe. The rocket that becomes a home. Space exploration has always followed a familiar script. Build a massive, impossibly complex rocket. Use it just once to send a tiny capsule into space and then let the expensive parts burn up in the atmosphere. It's a tradition born from the Apollo era, but not all things are what they seem because that tradition is about to be shattered. SpaceX isn't just building a rocket, it's building a two-for-one deal for the cosmos. The centerpiece of this revolution is Starship, a vehicle that stands nearly 400 feet tall when stacked on its super-heavy booster, making it the most powerful launch system ever created by humanity. It can lift a staggering 150 metric tons, that's over 300,000 pounds, into orbit. To put that in perspective, that's like launching an entire blue whale into space. But here's the detail that has everyone talking. The plan, codenamed Moonbase Alpha, is deceptively simple. Step one, launch a starship to the moon. Step two, land it vertically on the lunar surface. Step three, tip the entire massive spacecraft on its side. And just like that, you don't have a temporary lander. You have the foundation of a permanent human base. The empty propellant tanks, which are enormous, become instant real estate. The crew quarters designed for the long journey to Mars become living spaces, labs, and storage areas. Think about that. No complex construction, no waiting for separate habitat modules to arrive. The transport is the habitat. This is the kind of thinking that changes industries overnight. Many people are crazy about this because it cuts through decades of bureaucratic red tape and logistical nightmares that have plagued government space programs. The sheer volume inside a single starship is over 35,000 cubic feet, more space than the entire International Space Station, which took dozens of launches and over a decade to assemble. With Moonbase Alpha, SpaceX could deliver that much living space in a single trip. The plan then gets even more brilliant. Once the starship is horizontal, lunar bulldozers and robots would pile several feet of moon dust, or regolith, over the hull. This isn't just for show. That layer of moon dust acts as a natural shield. You see, the moon has no atmosphere and no magnetic field, leaving it exposed to deadly cosmic radiation and constant bombardment by micrometeorites. A thick blanket of regolith solves that problem for free, using local materials. Power would come from vast, unfurlable solar arrays, providing an almost unlimited energy supply during the two-week-long lunar day. This isn't just a concept. It's a fully-fledged architectural plan for off-world living and it could happen years, if not a decade, ahead of any competitor. For SpaceX, it's a breakthrough. For NASA, it's a crisis, because the world is now asking why a private company is outpacing America's space agency. So, how could this put NASA in trouble? SpaceX's speed versus NASA's gridlock. While SpaceX is sprinting, NASA appears to be stuck in bureaucratic quicksand. The agency's grand plan to return to the moon is the Artemis program, and on the surface, it's inspiring. But the thing nobody tells you is the brutal reality of its progress and cost. NASA is relying on its Space Launch System, or SLS, a rocket that, while powerful, is a relic of a bygone era. It's completely expendable, meaning the core stage and its engines, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, are thrown away with every single launch. The cost per launch is estimated to be a mind-boggling $4 billion. Let me say that again. $4 billion for one trip. For that price, you could build three NFL stadiums. This staggering cost has created a cascade of problems. The entire Artemis program budget is projected to hit $93 billion by the year 2025. That financial strain means delays are not just possible, they're inevitable. The first crewed mission, Artemis II, which will only orbit the moon, 
has already been pushed back to at least April of 2026. The mission that's supposed to actually land astronauts, Artemis 3, won't happen until mid-2027 at the absolute earliest, and many experts believe even that is wildly optimistic. NASA's own Inspector General has repeatedly warned about the program's lack of cost transparency and ambitious schedules. Here's where SpaceX's plan becomes a direct threat. NASA has already paid SpaceX billions to develop a special lunar version of Starship to act as the lander for Artemis 3. But you see, NASA's plan is incredibly convoluted. The SLS rocket will launch four astronauts in a small Orion capsule. They will then travel for days to lunar orbit, where they have to dock with the waiting Starship lander. Two astronauts will transfer to Starship, land on the moon, spend about a week on the surface, and then launch back up to dock with Orion again for the trip home. It's a complex orbital dance that introduces numerous points of failure. SpaceX's Moon Base Alpha plan effectively makes this entire process obsolete. Why go through all that trouble when Starship can take a full crew and 100 tons of cargo directly from Earth orbit to the lunar surface and stay there? It's like taking a private jet versus flying commercial with three layovers. One is a direct solution, the other is a product of compromise and legacy hardware. NASA is now in the awkward position of paying a contractor to develop a technology that is rapidly making the agency's own core architecture, the $4 billion per launch SLS, look like a dinosaur. This is the trouble SpaceX has created. It has exposed the deep inefficiency of the old way of doing things. And now NASA is facing a choice. Stick with its slow, fantastically expensive plan, or admit that a private company has fundamentally out-innovated it. And this existential crisis for NASA isn't happening in a vacuum. Other world powers have been watching very, very closely, blindsided by the Falcon. For years, the other major players in space have been China and Russia. They saw NASA's slow-moving Artemis program and laid out their own deliberate, long-term plans. Their joint project is called the International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS. Their strategy is the complete opposite of SpaceX's blitzkrieg approach. It's a slow, methodical burn, heavily reliant on robotics in the early stages. The plan is to launch a series of robotic missions throughout the late 20s and early 30s to survey the lunar south pole. The goal is to master in situ resource utilization, a fancy term for living off the land. They are developing technology to 3D print structures using melted moon dust and to extract water ice from shadowed craters. Their base would be built piece by piece over a decade, with the first human presence not even penciled in until 2036 at the earliest. To them, the race was a marathon, not a sprint. They were content to let NASA spend its billions while they steadily built up their capabilities. Then came Moon Base Alpha. SpaceX's plan to land entire prefabricated habitats threw a wrench into everyone's timeline. Why spend 10 years learning how to 3D print a rudimentary shelter when an American company can deliver a fully functional base with more living space than the ISS in a single flight? The shock to the system cannot be overstated. All of a sudden, their decade-long plan looked catastrophically slow. The reactions have been telling. Russia's space program, Roscosmos, has been facing its own severe challenges. The recent failure of its Luna 25 lander, which crashed into the moon, was a major blow to national pride and a stark reminder of how its capabilities have waned since the Soviet era. They are now more of a junior partner to China. China, on the other hand, has a very capable and ambitious program. They are the only country to have successfully landed a rover on the far side of the moon. But even their impressive progress is based on a conventional step-by-step -step approach. They are developing a super heavy rocket, the Long March 9, but it's still years away from being operational. Starship is already flying. SpaceX has changed the clock. The marathon has become a sprint and China and Russia were caught warming up on the sidelines. They simply can't believe that a private company could single-handedly accelerate the timeline by an entire decade. This new reality has kicked off a frantic behind-the-scenes scramble. The race is no longer just about national prestige. It's about securing a foothold on the most valuable real estate in the solar system. But what happens when one company gets there first and starts changing the locks? The lunar land rush. So here we are, on the cusp of a new reality. 
a private American company, not a government, is poised to establish the first permanent human settlement on another world. This isn't just a technological leap, it's a philosophical one, and it forces us to ask some very serious questions. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which forms the bedrock of space law, clearly states that no nation can claim sovereignty over a celestial body. But the thing nobody tells you is that the treaty is silent about private companies. What happens when SpaceX lands that first starship and declares Moonbase Alpha operational? Who makes the rules? This is where the future gets incredibly messy, fascinating, and more than a little unnerving. The establishment of a permanent base on the moon, like the proposed Moonbase Alpha, isn't just a scientific achievement. It's the firing of a starting pistol for a lunar land rush. You see, the lunar south pole, a region of permanent shadow, is believed to hold vast deposits of water ice. In the barren vacuum of space, water is a resource more valuable than all the gold in Fort Knox. The thing nobody tells you is that with water, you have everything. It can be purified for drinking, used to grow food, and most importantly, it can be broken down into its base elements, hydrogen and oxygen. That's breathable air for colonists and high-grade rocket fuel for the spaceships that will take us to Mars and beyond. The company that controls the water controls the entire future of travel and commerce in the inner solar system. We're talking about a monopoly on the gas stations of the future. But what if there's an even bigger, more secret reason for this sudden, frantic rush back to the moon? Some people are starting to ask the right questions. Why now? Why the mad dash back to this silent, dusty world after 50 years of almost complete neglect? It's a question that opens the door to some truly wild theories, ideas that are starting to surface from the fringes. The whispers suggest that recent high-resolution probes may have detected strange anomalies, things that just don't fit with our understanding of lunar geology. We're talking about unusual energy signatures from deep within craters, or perhaps non-natural geometric shapes buried just beneath the lunar dust, things that governments can't or won't talk about publicly. The chilling possibility is that SpaceX isn't just being sent to build a base. It's being sent on the most important recovery mission in the whole of human history. Does this all just happen overnight? The implications are absolutely staggering. Are we truly witnessing the dawn of humanity becoming a multi-planetary species? Or are we just watching the groundwork being laid for a private corporate kingdom in the sky? This question leads us down an even darker path to a theory that is almost too frightening to consider. That Moon Base Alpha isn't an outpost for humanity, but a lifeboat for the elite. It's a Galt's Gulch in the sky, a place to escape to if or when things on Earth go horribly wrong. Think about it. A company like SpaceX isn't bound by the same rules as a nation. A corporation doesn't have to hold elections. It doesn't answer to the public, only to its shareholders and its board of directors. What happens when this lunar base becomes fully self-sufficient, capable of producing its own air, water, food, and fuel? What stops its CEO from simply declaring independence? Will this bold move spark a new era of cooperation? or a bitter new space race for resources? Let us know what you think in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more deep dives into the future of space. What do you think is the biggest risk of a private company colonizing the moon?